Hi, and welcome to the A Quilting Life podcast. I'm Chelsea Stratton from Chelsea Stratton Designs. And I'm Sherry McConnell from A Quilting Life. And this episode is airing Monday, November 22nd. And we're very excited because we have the Jenny Doan uh, <laughs> with us today. And just, it's going to be a great conversation. I am sad that I'm actually, we're taping this at a different time. Uh, I was sick while uh, mom uh, did the interview with Jenny. So I wasn't feeling very well. So I'm sad that I missed it, but I had the opportunity to read her bu- her book and listen to the interview. And I just uh, can't wait to get into it. Yeah. Yeah, it was a it was a really fun conversation with Jenny. We know that you know all about who she is, but I feel like you'll still might learn some fun things. And uh, she was so positive and so inspirational, and and gave some really good advice and tips that you'll want to hear. So, yeah, yeah. And she she even uh, she even made a pitch to me about to you know get into quilting a little bit more. She <laughs> did. She did. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she she just threw that out there for Billy. Yeah, yeah so that that was interesting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All uh, right. So do you? Mom has a couple things to share before we get into that, and so yeah. Hello, everyone. I apologize for this brief interruption, but at the time of our recording of this episode, we did not have this special Black Friday week deal from Wild Grain yet, and we wanted to share it with you. You've heard my mom talk about Wild Grain before in previous podcasts, but they are offering a new special discount starting today, Monday, November 22nd, and that runs through the end of November, which is next Tuesday, the 30th. So this deal, which actually lasts for eight days, even though it's a Black Friday deal, will get you $30 off your first box when you subscribe, And you will also get a free extra loaf of sourdough bread in each box for the life of your subscription. So if you're watching on YouTube, I have a picture of it up there on the screen now. And of course, my mom always puts those pictures on her show notes blog post if you want to click that link and and take a look at that as well. But all you have to do to receive this offer, obviously use it within that time frame that I, I read, but you just need to click the link that is either in the description below on the YouTube channel or it will also be in the show notes underneath the podcast player that that you are listening to. So you just click on that link and then there you can sign up and it will automatically give you that $30 off and will include that free loaf of sourdough bread for the life of your subscription. So my mom has really enjoyed it and I was actually able to taste a couple products of that myself just last week, and it was really good. So if that is something you're interested in, we would really appreciate it, you know, clicking on that link and subscribing to that also will um, help support this podcast. So without further ado, I'll get you back to the show and enjoy the rest of the episode. So just the quilt on the wall and the quilt on the table are both from my Labor of Love quilt book. And I was just, you know, we taped this interview on a fall day and I was going for a fall vibe in here. And so we have farmhouse garden on the wall made with primitive gatherings fabrics. And then on the table, we have cottage charm made with Lilla Boutique fabrics. And both of these patterns are in the book. And so I just, uh, just cozy fall fall vibes going on here and i piece this one you did piece this one this one yeah it should say that in the book too i'm just i think it does like i I think no i just was looking at it and i'm like oh my goodness it looks so familiar yes pieced by sherry mcconnell and chelsea stratton quilted by Miriam bott yes and val krieger quilted the one on the wall amazing Yeah. yeah and then just one more thing before we start the the interview with jenny uh, her new book, How to Stitch an American Dream, A Story of Family, Faith, and the Power of Giving, is on the table. And we've all had, the, even Billy, read. <laughs> so we, we all, the publisher sent us a copy, and uh, we all enjoyed reading Jenny's book. And we'll just jump right into the conversation now. Hi, everyone. I 
am so excited to be here on the phone with Jenny Doan. We know you're going to absolutely love this conversation. We've been excited about it here. And so I just want to say welcome, Jenny. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. Uh, for those of you who are watching on YouTube, you can see that I have Jenny's book on the table, and it's How to Stitch an American Dream, uh, a story of family, faith, and the power of giving. And this is going to be a must read for every quilter. I, I've i just really been enjoying it. Thank you. Oh, you did such a beautiful job with it. Uh Actually, Billy's on the line here too, and he's also read lots of it. Yeah, yeah, I, I sure have, and and uh, uh, a lot of fascinating stories that that um, you were able to share with everybody. And, Thank you so much. And Appreciate that. What I I don't know. I think what struck me the most was just the positivity, even when you're sharing difficult times. And I know you're looking back at these events in hindsight, but it's so positive and I feel like it the book is just uplifting for anyone so really I am blessed with a real Pollyanna a real Pollyanna spirit you know and so I just always look for the good yeah. you know if something uh, some kind of trial comes along then I'm like all right what do I need to learn from this so I can just get through it you know and um, I've just always been you know I have kind of a joyful soul and so cute we handle so many things with humor in our family and that just, it just keeps you going. Humor and gratitude, I think, are my two go-tos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I enjoyed looking at all of your family's uh, Halloween costume pictures on Instagram, too. That, were, <laughs> that was oh, really gosh, fun. Yeah. We <laughs> love that. We do love that. Thank you. But my background is in costuming and musical theater. And so I lo- well, Halloween has always been a really big deal for our family. And, and my children are awesome costume makers as well. And they are clever. So I'm always excited to see what they do as well. Yeah, that was really fun. Uh, you know, for for most of our interview episodes, we have asked our guests to just kind of talk about how they got into quilting. I feel like your story is so well known, but yet, I don't know, what what would you want to, how would you introduce yourself, I guess, <laughs> is, is uh, uh, just the first question. Just well, kind of take it any direction you want to. Well, I got into quilting um, because my children got too old to wear matching clothing, you know, <laughs> all their lives, all their childhood lives. You know, I dressed like if we ever went to a park or to an event or to anything, you know, um, and that was just the genre. You know, when you look back on pictures women my age took of their families, it's like you see all the children are dressed in little sailor outfits. All the children are dressed in, you know, we just did that. It was an Olin Mills kind of a thing. And um, and so uh, really sewing is my go-to. It's what I do for stress. It's what I do for when I'm happy, sad, anxious, you know, I go to the sewing machine. And so um, for me, sewing is a must. And um, I got into, you know, once, once I got into uh, theater, well, I've, I've been in theater all my life since high school, but, but I started uh, doing costuming as well. And that's a completely different kind of sewing than clothing sewing. It's the shortcut version of clothing sewing. It's, it's what has to look good from 20 feet out, out and hold together for two weeks. The problem with that is somebody's going to use it one time. And um, for me, I love the longevity of things. And so when we moved to Missouri, uh, I went right to the theater, offered my costuming experience, and they did one show a year here in the little theater in town, and they didn't need my costuming experience. And so I uh, was like, what am I going to do? You know, my children were... My youngest children were teenagers by then, and I just, I just didn't even know what I was going to do because so, um, I had to sew. And somebody suggested I take a quilting class, and I literally said these words, old people do that. And, um, but I got desperate enough that I wanted to take the class. Uh, it was a little Botech class over in Chillicothe, and so I literally um, called the teacher up because I didn't know anything about choosing fabric for quilts. Uh-huh. And I talked her into going on a shopping trip with me. So we went to Ben Franklin and picked out the fabrics that we needed to make. She was teaching a log cabin a quilt. And uh, so I went to the class and I was making these blocks and I would take my blocks home. And I was so astounded. You know, when you teach a class, you teach, this is how we're going to lay it out. This is how we're going to do it. And um, 
And I turned all the blocks and a whole pattern appeared. Now, I didn't know there were books written on the blog set. <laughs> I didn't know there was a hundred different ways to set it. I just was astounded by the patterns that were appearing by just me turning the blocks. And so I, I would sew them together. Then I would realize that I couldn't go back to class without a set of blocks. So I would make another set. And by the end of the class, I had literally made six or seven quilts. Oh. Um, and I was so, I was literally hooked, just just really hooked in this, the creativity of this. And so I joined with, up with a little group over there um, that over in Chillicothe, which is about 30 miles from us, and uh, started sewing with them. And, and they would, you know, because my mind works in shortcuts. And I think there are two reasons for that. One, the costuming really teaches you shortcuts. But two, I have a large family and I could only sew in snippets. So I had to get a lot done in that time. And my brain has always worked you know, shortcuts for cooking, shortcuts for sewing, shortcuts for whatever I was doing. And, uh, and so I, I just think in terms of that. So I would be sewing something and I'd be like, well, this is how I did it. And they're, I'm like, is that okay? And they like, well, I guess there's not a rule about it. It, it works, you know? <laughs> and so they were so funny because do things completely different than they were, but they were still very supportive of what I was doing. And so. That was really, that was my first little uh, introduction to quilting uh, was that. And I quilted for probably close to 10, 12 years before, um, before we opened our shop. So oh, wow, that's yeah. my introduction. Yeah, I love that. Um, I, I also love in the book, I, I don't know which one of your children said it, but somebody said like, mom, what do you want to do for the next 50 years? Right. I, I love that, that attitude that, you know, being in the middle part of your life and then just how you. Well, I, my grandmother lived to be a hundred. And oh. so when Alan, when I turned 50, I thought, well, I'm on my downhill slide. You know, I'm older now. Now I'm 50. I'm older. And in my mind, you know, my parents were 50. It didn't matter what age they were. In my mind, they were always 50. Uh -huh. And I'm like, so. I'm as old as my parents now, and now it's just the downhill slide. And Alan said to me that, said that one day, he said, um, Mom, what do you want to do for the, for the rest of your life? And I'm like, well, I figure I'll just, you know, I've been years, 15 years till I retire, you know. And it wasn't like I'd ever really worked a job. You know, I've, I've been a mother all those years, and, um, which, which is an oxymoron right there, you know, because that is a big job. But as far as being a professional out in a career, you know, I didn't have that. And so, um, so I, I really put some thought into that because it occurred to me that my first 50 years felt crucial and important. And it felt like every day mattered. I was raising a family and that mattered to me. The second part of that was that if I lived the age my grandmother lived, I had actually more life ahead of me than I had behind me. And I wanted to make sure that that part of my life mattered as well. But when I got into the quilting part, you know, of teaching quilting, I mean, my whole thought process, and understand, I live in the present. I live right here, right now. I don't think ahead. I don't look behind. I'm not going that direction. I'm real happy right where I am, right in the present. But I didn't, in my mind, it was like, well, I'll teach people how to sew, and then maybe they'll send me their quilts for them to quilt. And that was my whole thought process. That was it, uh -huh. you know. And, of course, Alan is a way forward thinker, futuristic, willing to risk the farm, you know, a big risk taker. And I'm just like happy here sewing. Uh -huh. I didn't know at the time it was going to make a difference. I had no idea that what I was going to do was going to make, have such a huge impact on people's lives and on the quilting industry in general. I just had no idea. It wasn't, it wasn't even part of the plan, but it's been amazing serendipitous journey. Oh, yeah, it's it's been so fun to follow. Uh, I, I, I was, it just made me think of how uh, when you had the the birthday celebration in the book and how your husband went and got like fifty hot dogs and and oh, how, yes. how uh, then he had to go get more and then he had to buy out the store because so many people showed up and and that just shows that was amazing to us. Yes, yeah, just amazing. Yeah, would you? Mind just kind of talking about the joys and some of the struggles of of building your fam your business with your family. 
Yeah. People ask me all the time, what's the best and the worst part about your job? And the best and worst part about my job is the same answer. It's working with my family. <laughs> and so, um, you know, working with family is difficult. And we have two of my children actually own the company and we work for them. So there's that dynamic that comes into play with things. Um, and then also there's the dynamic of the personalities. You know, you don't want every family dinner that you have to be spent talking about work. And yet that's what you do together. That's what you all do. And um, and uh, the flip side of that is that watching them, you know, watching us succeed, watching them succeed, watching everybody. So as a, as a family growing up, I mean, if you have more than a, well, even, even if you just have a couple of children, you realize that they are so different. And I thought my children were all going to be just like me. And they weren't. They were all so different. And, and as growing up, that was really difficult for them because, you know, it would be like, how come I can't be like her? How come I can't do this as easy as she can? You know, and that's where that quote, I can remember my mother telling me, you do the best you can. I'd be happy for him. He can do it better. You know, and so I was constantly saying that. But in a business, in a company, they all have a niche, a niche where they sit, where uh, where what they do is important and it matters, and they can develop to their full potential. And so, because our company is large enough, they, you know, like, um, you know, Natalie will do triple play with me, but she doesn't. She's not an extrovert, you know, and so she uh, she prefers the behind the scenes stuff. She's editor of Block Magazine. She loves doing that. Um, you know, Alan loves to be out there. Alan loves the computer, so he's over all the things like that that happens. To that Sarah loves uh, the town, running things, um, construction. She runs all those things. She helps, you know, decorate the stores. She does everything with the town she's connected to. And so everybody gets really to do what they love to. And watching that is just pure, pure joy. But it it has definitely had its, its challenges for sure. I can remember walking in one time on Sarah and Alan, and they were both had their heads on the table, and they were shoulders were shaking, they were both sobbing. And I said, to, I said to him, guys, I don't know what's going on here, but remember, your relationship matters than anything we're going to do here in this business. And they both popped their heads up and go, "Wait, oh, mom," <laughs> you know. And uh, and I'm just glad they knew that because that is more important than anything we'll do here. And so, uh, you know, we. It, it is, it's a bit of work, but it's also, for us, it's really been, it's really been worth the challenge. Yeah, I, I love that. And I, I loved at the end of the book how you also shared uh, where all the children live now and kind of what they do with the company. <clears throat> that, w- that was really interesting to me yeah. at the end of the book, too. Yeah, and, and, yeah, you know, and we, that's morphed over the years, obviously. Oh, go, go ahead. Go, oh, I was just going to say real quick that um, learning from, from you and your family, you have a larger family than ours, but... You know, my mom and sister started designing fabric, what, about seven years ago, was it? Uh, yes. Around, around yeah. there, generally. And then I didn't really jump on board until the, the pandemic, and all of a sudden I had more free time on my hands to do YouTube videos with my mom. And, and uh, we had done them sort of sporadically before, but but yeah, we, we're, we're obviously at a much smaller scale, but it's good to hear that, the, you know, that advice and, and sort of how you guys have operated as a family made it work really well and, and everyone's, everyone's good. So it's um, interesting for us to, to learn well, from you, that. You really do learn to trust each other and their abilities. You know, I, I tend to want to have an opinion about everything, but at the end of the day, I know that it's, it's this person's job to make that decision. And so, you know, I share what I think and then I trust them to make the right thing. I, I battled Alan on some of these big decisions, like our main shop, you know, he had all these different ideas. And I said to him, Alan, you know, I mean, I battled him on it. And at <laughs> one point, he said to me, he said to me, Mom, you're trying to make this into the same quilt shop you've been going through your entire life. I want to do something new and different. And I want you to give me a chance. And he said, if it doesn't work in three years, change it and we'll just we'll change it all up, you know, and I'm just like, all right, you know, when your kid said that to you, I want you to give me a chance. You're just like, okay, you know what? I'm going to give you a chance and I'm going to, I'm just going to stand back and watch this happen. And what he did, you know, with like modernizing the quilt shop and the quilt arena, I think it almost gave the quilters, it honored what they were doing, that they were, you know, now they, that they were also moving forward. And so when people come to our main shop and there's iPads where they, 
you know, they put in their information and then they have a, a code that they just check out at every store because we have all these different stores. So they don't have to put in their information at every store. They just feel so uh, technologically prepared. I mean, prepared. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I mean, it's just it's just he's done some really clever things, I think, that have really honored uh, our industry, uh, especially the little town here. That's yeah. been really fun. Oh, yeah. I would I would love to come one day. I was I was in the area. I can't remember a couple of years, a few years ago before the pandemic. I was teaching at a little shop in Brunswick, and I was so excited with how. We would love to have you. Oh my goodness, I was so excited about how close I was to you. But the only free time was on Sunday, and of course you're closed on Sunday, and that was the day I was just going back to the, are, yeah. to the airport and going home. But. Oh God! I was telling everybody. I was. That's how so many. <laughs> that's how so many of our events are, aren't they? We just fly in, fly out. Yeah. You know, I, I started taking a few extra days um, with my events so that I at least could see something. You know. Right. Yeah, and in fact, on that trip, my husband had actually gone with me, and he went and saw more things than I did because he could go take the rental car and drive around while I was teaching. So. But uh, yeah, so, uh, I, I feel like also uh, your book right now is so timely because of the pandemic. So many people are reevaluating their life and what they're doing. And, you know, here your story didn't with the business. Of course, you know, our, our, our whole life influences everything. But, but where you formally made it a business in your 50s, I feel like that can be so inspirational to people right now who are looking to make a change. And also because I've noted that a lot of women don't even start quilting till they're in their 50s or older. So I just feel like, yeah, this whole part of it is just so timely uh, for for you to be putting your story out in print for people to read. Well, we we have seen people... um, and people survive in the pandemic and it's the survivors that are so amazing to me because we have a little restaurant in town and of course we closed our town down for 14 months but she thought outside of the box and she started doing family dinners for people in town and she would take orders online and you come up and pick up your dinner for your family and she survived because she thought outside the box. And, you know, most of us still didn't want to cook five days a week, you know, right. and so we were happy to have a family dinner. And she only did it on Tuesday, Thursday. So it wasn't like you could do it every day and you got tired of it, but it was like everybody waited for Tuesday and Thursday and we'd line up to get our, our meatloaf and mashed potatoes and green beans or whatever it was <laughs> that she was cooking. And she was so smart to do that because, you know, you just have to figure out how you're going to do it. Now for us, our town closed down. And so we have a large Amish and Mennonite community and we just didn't want to risk, you know, their medical thing is a whole different deal. And we didn't want to risk um, bringing somebody in that could wipe out our community. So we, we opted to close the town down. Now the miracle for me is that all of those people who work for us in town went out to the warehouse. We never had to lay a single person off because our warehouse business picked up, you know, the online business picked up because more people are home. Right. And then we never stopped hiring. And so for us, to me, I consider that a complete miracle because not only did, but did we survive, but we flourished. And then, of course, you know, because of the mask thing, we became essential. Right. Uh, we were selling fabric for masks and things like that. And I mean, I, I just can, I just, that just amazes me every single day that, you know, how that all happened. For us. So I, I just loved watching the people who survived that and that they were willing to roll with it and, you know, I mean, do things differently. Like I don't travel very much anymore, but I do a lot of Zooms and I do a lot of interviews, you know, and so that, I mean, it's just, you just roll with it. Right. Yeah, it's been fascinating. One thing in the book I did want to go back to is kind of the story of when you and your daughters first went to quilt market. I wondered if you could like (laughs) share, because (laughs) it seems so much, you know, I think anyone who goes to quilt market maybe remembers the first time they went (laughs) and how overwhelming it is. I I was uh, thinking of my own first trip to quilt market and I was lucky to be driving up with Camille Ross Kelly. And she kind of prepared me on the drive up to Salt Lake about 
what I was going to see and experience and feel, but I, if you could maybe expound on oh, your word. experience, yes. <laughs> we just had no idea. So one of the reasons we didn't carry fabric is because we couldn't afford an entire line of fabric. We didn't want to go into debt with this. You know, we'd gone into a little bit of debt, to get the quilt machine for me. It came to my house. It was too big for my house. So we had to buy a building. The building cost less than the machine did. <laughs> we had a business now. And people were saying things to me like, um, you know that green fabric you used in that tutorial? I would love some of that. And I was like, well, it's mine. It's my fabric. I'm not <laughs> selling fabric. It's just my fabric. You know, and so we were like, well, we should buy some fabric. So we looked at it and we just were like, we just can't afford and carry a line. And if we did carry a line, what line would it be? You know, and so things really with quilt market, they weren't online yet. So we decided that we would find out about, you know, we, Sarah did some searching and we found out that they had this big market in Houston and we decided that we would go and Sarah, I think we had maybe, maybe a couple of thousand dollars. Um, I'd be surprised if we even had that, but <laughs> we were standing, the first night was the, um, that, uh, well, what's the night where you, you get to go in, oh, everybody waits in line. And sample you spree. Oh, sample spree. Yeah. Sample spree. So, we, so sample spree. So, you know, we're, we're huge bargain hunters. We have a big family. We're huge bargain hunters. You know, we're like, we're going to sample spree, you know. And so we waited in line and we were in line with this woman and she's like, well, we just opened a new shop and we only had 80000 to invest in. So we barely have anything. And Sarah looks at me and I look at her and we just, we're just like, oh my gosh, you know. And so, you know, we, we got some things at sample spree and, um, and then we went looked at all the stuff at market and uh, we sat down and talked to a couple of people who were selling fabrics and we, we didn't purchase a single fabric and, but we put a card in every uh, bowl, you know, there's always things you, where you can win something if you put your card in there. Right. And so we put our card in every bowl and, you know, we were kind of hoping that that might bring people to our, to talk to us about whatever they were, you know, actually, we we, re we never really had anybody contact us except oh. the guy from Moda. Oh, interesting. And, um, and and it was months, months later. And Sarah had, I guess, had been talking to him a little bit online, and he finally came. And she wasn't there that day. And and she's like, he's like, can I come in and show you some fabrics? And I'm like, well, sure, you know. But uh, and and they started showing me these fabrics, and you know, I wanted them all, but I. <sighs> I knew, I knew we couldn't afford him. And that's when he said, well, have you thought about the pre-cuts? Because you could sell a pre-cut and then you'd have, you could buy a, um, you know, a bolt of fabric for your border and finish your project. And I was like, oh my gosh, we could do that. So, you know, as far as market goes, we really, you know, it was, it was so overwhelming. There were so many things to see, um, you know, and I just, uh, I was just blown away by the whole market thing. I mean, I was like, you know, we're on aisle 2000. You know, and it was just <laughs> right. like so, so incredibly huge. And, um, you know, we took everybody's pamphlet. We sat at night on our beds in the hotel room looking through everything. You know, what could we do? Could we do this? Could we do that? Trying to figure out how we could do it. On the way home, we stopped at the motor warehouse and we loaded um, our car full of uh individual bolts of fabric that we thought we, we could do something with, uh -huh. you know, um, and, and then of course, when you get up to check out with that, a lot of it is already sold. So they're like, nope, you can't have this. You can't have this. You can't have this, you know? So we went to the clearance rack there and we bought, you know, whatever we thought we could do something with on the clearance rack. And the, somebody's advice to us was buy fabric that you love, because if you, if you, if your shop doesn't go and you can't sell it, you're going to have to wear it. You know, and so we were right. like, okay, well, I like this and this, you know, I could do this, you know. And, and so I think uh, we all picked something from that and we came home and we thought, I'm like, literally our, we had Sarah's old suburban and it was like, I mean, we had fabric bolts under our feet in between us. We just put as many as we could. But when we got home, it all fit on one shelf. Oh. <laughs> and so it was just, just nothing, you know. Yeah. And so when... uh when the motor guy finally came and we started doing pre-cuts, that was for me, that was the shortcut. I am, I do not have a knack of choosing colors. I'm a matcher. And so where Sarah and Natalie are both very good at it, I am not. And so I love the idea that a designer 
was putting all these things together for me. I felt like they were, you know, every time I opened a pack, they were working for me and I had to just learn to trust them because at first I'd go through these packs and I'd be like, Ooh, I don't like this one. Oh, I don't like this when I pull them apart, you know, and Sarah would be like, mom, you have to use them all. <laughs> and so I started using all the fabrics and all of a sudden my quilts were like really, you know, popping. They were like, wow, that's amazing. Where before I was like, ah, you know, my quilts were just, they were matching that, you know, so I had, you know, five blue florals, you know, right. <laughs> something like that. So, um, so I learned to trust and love the designers and, uh, and we, you know, our Moda guy, you know, he's our only guy who really came and, and, uh, you know, he ha he drives a real nice car now. <laughs> <laughs> I, bet, I, I bet he's so grateful he, he made that first visit. <laughs> Did so, did he ever yeah, he's, mention he's a, what made him go to such a small town and like like how he even knew that you're at that time that your quilt shop was even there? Did well, he ever mention that? I think it I think it was just a contact and we got we we left our business card and I think he just you know he's over the territory so right. he oh, just that's go right. visit all the little shops you know because that's how they make their you know that's how they make their money is every little shop buys a little bit and then you know they you know, that's how they make their commissions. And so I think he was just, you know, it's just part of his job and part of his territory. And I, I know, I know Sarah had been talking to, I think him, you know, mm -hmm. and so, uh, uh, you know, he just decided to come and visit and show us all the things and golly, we loved everything, but we couldn't <laughs> afford a single thing. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Cause he probably didn't have much expectations, but then, uh, but yeah, no. he hit a, hit a gold mine. So. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Well, eventually, eventually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and it was it, it, it took a while, but eventually, yes. And and is he still your rep today? I'm trying to think. He is. But okay. We do everything online now. Awesome. You know, yeah. We go, we go through. Uh, you know, we're, our our they literally have to. Um, most of the fabric companies hire a team to do our account because, you know, we're, we're not ordering three bowls. Right. You know? <laughs> right. Um. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that, that, I just, I just love hearing all of this. Uh, I was wondering if you had any, you know, like kind of time management tips. We talk about that a lot on this podcast. I, I feel like a lot of our viewers and listeners, they want to know, um, you know, how to, how to save time so they can quilt more. And so I figure you must have some great, great input on that. And, um, also maybe, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> I just think I'm pretty, um, I probably would guess I'm pretty ADD. And so I kind of wake up running in the morning uh -huh. and, uh, and, but I have things that I do. Like I always sew for me for a little bit before I sew for Missouri Star Natalie always says, eat your frog first thing in the morning. So the biggest, hardest thing I have to do, I do first thing, uh, because that's really when I have the most attention span and the most energy. And um, because by three or four o'clock in the afternoon, you know, that's when I do, I'm great with my rote sewing, you know, because I don't have to think about things. And so I'm just like, I'm just like putting things together at that point. But I literally sew all, mostly all day long. You know, I do a few interviews. I go out and walk through the town. I, um, you know, I, I, uh, you know, I have, I might have meet and greets or things like that. You know, if there, a bus is here or something like that. And so, but as far as the sewing goes, um, you know, I, I sew most of the time. Now I used to have sewing stuff at home. And when my children moved out, I've literally made over you know, we have three bedrooms in our house and I've literally made two of those bedrooms over probably four times into sewing room. But because as a mom, I always sewed at the dining room table. I was always dragging everything down to the dining room table. And I think that's because with children, you have to know what's going on. And right. if you're in a spring room, the house could fall apart. <laughs> and the <laughs> right. takes to put a sleeve in, you know. And so I would always sew at the dining room table. And so the sewing, I have a sewing machine that I keep at home. Um, you know, if I want to do something at night or on the weekends or something like that. But I literally moved most everything I have to the studio so that I could separate my home and my work. Um, but I still do, you know, I still do a lot of personal stuff. You know, I have 25 grandchildren and they're all at the age where they're graduating or getting married or, you know, so I make quilts for, for all of them and baby quilts and 
you know, so I still have lots of personal stuff to do as well. But um, I I had to learn to be happy for a long time, especially when my children were home. I know there's a lot of young moms that so I had to learn to be happy just to sew a seam together. You know, I used to think, oh, I'm not going to sew unless I can finish this. And and really, it's not how it works when you have a family. You know, your family has to be the most important thing that you do. And so, you know, I would be, if I could just get one little thing done, I was like, well, look at that. I got that one little thing done. And I had to, that was a whole mindset that I had to change. Uh, and so, you know, but night becomes our friend. And early morning never worked for me. If I was up at five, my children were up at five. So <laughs> that never worked for me. And, um, but evening time, you know, was a better time or nap time. Uh, you know, but, uh, now it's just, I tend to, I just tend to, I try to take care of myself first. I'm not very good at self care. And so I try to do something for myself first that I'm working on, you know, and, um, I know Bonnie Hunter calls them leaders and enders. And I, I don't actually do leaders and enders. I, there, there are like three or four blocks that I work on. Like I'll do wonky star blocks. I'll do the little tiny houses. I do, uh, you know, I mean, I just have several little things like that that I'll, I do crumb piecing. You know, I love to work with crumb piecing. And I do something that fills my soul before I start in for on my on my work for the day, which doesn't really feel like work. But, right. um, you know, it's for Missouri Star. It's not personal. So that's kind of what I do. Yeah. I don't know that that actually gives you more time, but. You know, I love just, that. <laughs> No, yeah. I love that. And uh, because I feel like when your hobby and your passion is also your business, you do have to keep that that spark for yourself alive. And so I feel like that's such great advice. Uh, I also love the part that you said about uh, for young moms, well, and even working mom, moms of any age or, or really anyone, just to, if you just do something small you know, that that's progress. And I think there was even a line in the book, like, did you say something? I feel like there was something like, if you sew just an hour, then the next day you're an hour better, right? So, so one of the things, one of the things I think as women that we do is we're constantly comparing ourselves to others. And maybe that's quotas in general or whatever, but it seems to be more female based to me. And, um, and I tell them all the time, this is your journey. You know, this is where you start and this is where you sew. You don't sew like a lady across the table from you. You sew like you. So if you sew an hour today, tomorrow you're an hour better. So be happy with where you are. Because people will always say to me, well, what about the first quilt you made? And I'm like, I honor those because that is where I began. And and every quilt gets a little better. You know, I didn't square a block for years, like years and years, because I just made them work. I just made them fit. Um, and, and they were fine. But I've always been utilitarian. I'm not a perfectionist. You know, I'm all about, um, I want somebody to use what I make. I want them to use it, love it, wear it out, you know. And um, and nobody's ever given a quote back to me because it wasn't perfect. And so while we're constantly getting closer and closer to uh, considering uh, what we call our, what a real quilter is or what, you know, what we feel like that is, I I realized I was a pretty good quilter. Moda hung a uh, Moda hung a big display of antique quilts, and I am walking along looking at those quilts, and the points don't match, and they're not perfect, and they don't hang straight, and the borders are wavy, and I looked at my husband, and I elbowed him, and I said, Juan, I think I'm a pretty dang good quilter. Mine at least hangs straight across the bottom, you know, <laughs> and I realized that, you know, here we were honoring these quilts from the past, and really, they are our hugest legacy. Our quilts are going to outlive us by generations. And, and they are, I mean, they are what we search for. They are what we collect. They are what we love. And we don't care who made them, but we honor those makers. And when I was looking at those, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, uh, you know, uh, two generations from now, something of mine is going to hang and somebody's going to think, well, you know what? That's not perfect. It's pretty cool. And I loved that idea. You know, I love seeing a block in an old quilt where there's like two themes to make it the big enough to fit, you know, because you yes. know that and it's thrifty. Uh-huh. And, um, and I loved that we were honoring those and it made me honor myself because I realized that even with all my imperfections, you know, my quilt is still filled with love. It's still going to keep somebody warm. It may give them hope, you know, 
we just don't know when we give a quilt, we don't know what the outcome is going to be. We don't know what, you know, what, how they're going to receive it. But we do know that it's going to outlive us by generations and it's going to carry emotion with it. And that doesn't happen in any other hobby. You know, it happens in quilting. And I really believe that, you know, we're sitting in our basement making the one thing and it feels insignificant. You know, we're in our sewing room. We're sewing this one quilt. We're finally to the stage in our journey because when you start, you know, it's a pretty selfish thing. You're making quilts for you. Uh, but as you go on, those quilts, you know, you fill up your house, you fill up your children, you fill up your grandchildren, and pretty soon you're giving them away to people. And sometimes you give them to people you don't even know. And when that starts to happen in your life, it literally changes the world for that person. And what I think as quilters, what they don't realize is how incredibly amazing it is that what they're giving is one quilt, so it feels insignificant, but it's happening all over the world. Every place I go, every quilter I meet, 80% of what they make, they're giving away. And literally those stitches are changing the very world that we live in. And I just don't think we've ever needed it like we need it now. And so when you see those things that people are giving out there, it's just, I have never been so honored to be part of a group of people in my life as I am of the quilters because what they're doing matters so much. And, and yet when we look at what we're doing ourselves, we think, oh, it's just one quilt. But I just feel like if I could just let them all know how amazing they are and how the stitches that they take in the privacy of their home are changing the world, then they, they could see what, what, a, what an amazing thing they're doing is. Because I think for the most part, most of us, you know, we tend to downplay what we're doing. But literally, for generations beyond you, that quilt is going to bring comfort to somebody. So I think that's just really, really a cool thing. I, I just love that, Jenny. I, I I just feel like that's is what it's all about. That it that is the essence of it. And and you're right. It's never been more needed than such a time as this. I I just absolutely love that. I I'm so grateful that we've been able to have this conversation with you today. I just feel um, inspired and uplifted, and I know that that all of the our listeners and viewers are just uh, feeling that way as well. And we just thank you so much for, for taking time oh, to my pleasure. visit. <laughs> my pleasure. I, I love to talk with you guys. It's so fun. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you. And, you know, there was one more question I wanted to ask right before we oh, let you okay. go. I, I was because... Um, I love that. I love that. Gotcha. <laughs> one question that my my mom and my sister get a lot when I'm going through comments on the on podcast are, you know, what are your favorite quilt blocks? And and as you guys were talking, I was like, I got to make sure I ask her before we let you go. Like, yeah. if you have, if Jenny Don has a favorite quilt block or or multiple or something like that. <laughs> so I actually don't have a favorite quilt block, um, but what I have is that favorite moment. So for me. The most incredible part about what I do is the creating part. And when I create a block, you know, I mean, people aren't inventing new shapes. We have the same shapes we've been working with forever. <laughs> and we just pre keep using them in different ways and creating different things. But what I love, the part I love is when you put two blocks together, because I can see the block, but I can't see what's going to happen when you put two blocks together and that secondary pattern appears. That is my favorite moment right there because I can't see that ahead of time. And it's like this amazing surprise where all of a sudden, you know, you've put it, you've snowballed that corner and all of a sudden it makes this other design that you weren't expecting. So for me, I love that favorite moment. That's my favorite part of quilting. And I really think that it's the creative part uh, of quilting that is so healing for people. Um, most of the letters I get from people are, um, they are from people who have, they have a story to tell. Their quilt has a story to tell. And they're all, uh, it's all helped them in a way they weren't expecting. And that was something I certainly wasn't expecting when I started. But for me, it's not about the block because I, I mean, there are blocks I love, you know, but um, I love that secondary pattern that appears. I love that moment that we've created something we didn't see coming in it. And it just is, it's just beautiful. It just, I love that moment. Well, th thank you for sharing that. That's that. Uh, I'm sure yeah. my uh, I don't yeah. quilt, but I'm sure my mom can relate to you a lot uh, yeah. with that. So yeah, I was well, sitting I, here I nodding my head. Start. There's a, 
I think you should start, Billy. There's a lot of good tutorials out there. That you, your mom has some. I have some. You should start cooking. <laughs> Qu- question: did, did did Al ever get be in front of the camera and and do a tutorial, or did he <laughs> did he completely stay 100 so percent behind Al, it? Al actually hasn't done well. He he actually speaks a lot and is in front of the camera a lot. He's yeah. not afraid of the camera, but he um, he doesn't. He has never done a quilting tutorial, but he has quilted. So okay. he actually requires everybody who works here. It's like, you're part of a quilting company. I think you should learn how to do this. And it was interesting because when he made a quilt, you know, he thought, I've been watching my mom do this my whole life. It's going to be a piece of cake. So he, he got a layer cake and um, he started, he got a template. He started cutting them up. He's going to do a coin with a Dresden uh, blade, you know, leave it open. And, uh, and Natalie had to help him cut and he got that together. And then it had to be squared smaller because it was quite straight and um, he had help all along the way and he got to the quilt machine and you know our quilt machines are computerized we're sitting there you know watching the quilt and holding on to it making sure that you know there's no folds or pleats and making it happen and his comment was I have put over 20 hours of my life into this quilt and quilters put over 20 hours of their life into something that they give away they are amazing You know, and that was the first time he realized what a big deal that was, you know, and I was just, you know, just, I think until you experience that, you you don't even really know what goes into it. You know, people are just like, oh, you made a quilt. How nice. You know, it's just like until you, until you do it, you just don't realize what, uh, what a credible um, act of love that is. So that was really interesting to me that he picked up on that. And then he was like, I think that's a good company should make a quilt. (laughs) <laughs> oh, yeah. well, I guess we well, can announce it to the to the listeners that w- me and my mom actually had talked about me getting in front of the camera and doing just a she was the there first thing go. I was going to do was a pillowcase. So yeah. I if I can, maybe I'll start with something like that and then we'll see what happens. But that would be awesome. Yeah. So I always thought it would be huge if my boys all did it like after my tutorial went out they they did a tutorial called let's see if we really can make mom's quilt oh yeah you know oh, yeah. they had a whole show on that i think it would be huge yeah. you know but i can't i can't talk them all into it <laughs> right <laughs> Yeah, that is but a good i idea. think people would think that was awesome you know uh, yeah I, agree. I think and i do think uh you know we the the quilting world in general there's a lot of male quilters out there but they aren't front and center and I think that uh, the more we can get that, because every time I would go speak, they would say something, you know, there'd be six of them would come up and go, are there more like me? And I'm like, yes, there are. Yeah. And they're watching on YouTube right. because they don't really feel comfortable maybe going into a quilt shop to take class, but they're learning on YouTube and they are just, you know, there's just way more of them than we realize. Yes. And um, it's the same thing with children, you know, children, parents aren't going to pay for them to take class, but they're going to sit them in front of the computer and you know, all of a sudden I have this children's following because they're, you know, they're learning to quilt online and YouTube has just done amazing things for our industry. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh. Well, that's been inspirational then for sure. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, you bet. You bet. I, I could just keep talking all day, but I know we have to end sometime. So, oh, but we just so, well, really quick. Do you have a favorite pre-cut? Favorite pre-cut? Uh, I probably do love layer cakes the most okay. because okay. they can be cut into all the other shapes. Yes. You know, they're, they're the versatile one. They can be cut into a jelly roll, into a charm pack. Right. And so, uh, but I do love them all. And yeah. Tell Chelsea we missed her. I will. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully she's, she said she's just going to rest and her, her youngest is also not feeling well. So, uh, but bad. wow. Thank you so much, Jenny. I feel like motivated for the rest of my day. I'm glad this is early in my day. I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, oh, awesome. I'm, I'm just so grateful. And uh, we're, we're so thankful for you. Well, let us know next. Let us know next time you come to Hamilton. We'd love to see you. Okay. And truly, truly, it's Disneyland for quilters. I yes. mean, there, every fabric has its own shop. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> I, I need to get there. I actually have family from uh, Iowa and Nebraska. And so I need to just oh, very cool. add it into a visit one of these days. So uh, there yeah. You go. And just once more, we'll, we just want to remind everyone that uh, Jenny's book, How to Stitch an American Dream, is uh, available now. And we will have links in the description below to where uh, all of Jenny's links, I'm, I'm sure <laughs> everyone already knows where to find her, but we'll 
put that in there just in case there's uh, anybody that needs that information. And we'll have a, a link so you can go and get her book on Amazon. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you for having me. You guys have a wonderful day. Thank right, you. Thank All you. right. We'll see you later. Okay. So I hope that everyone enjoyed that wonderful conversation with Jenny. She is such an inspiration and uh, just uh, so wonderful uh, that you had the chance to talk to her. And um, I learned so much from uh, reading her book and listening to the interview myself. And uh, so our next podcast episode is actually going to air a week from now because we had five Mondays in November. Yes. So Monday, <laughs> November 29th, and it is actually a listener question podcast. So uh, we had a lot of uh, questions pile up since we haven't done one in a while, and it's going to be a lot of fun to get back to that. So yeah. So thanks so much for stopping by. 